Hi, everyone. Welcome to We On Live broadcast, New York City. I'm Susan Tehrani. First, let's take a look at the latest stories making headlines this hour. After the Pentagon claimed Beijing declined to meet the U.S. defense chief, China says the U.S. should, quote, correct its incorrect actions and show sincerity for military dialogue. Amid soaring tensions in Kosovo, Russia tells the West to stop its deceitful propaganda, asks the West to stop desperate Serbs who it says are trying to defend their legitimate rights and freedom. Surveillance video released of the shock and horror when gunfire erupted on a beach boardwalk in Florida. On Monday evening, nine people, including a baby and children, were injured. Manhunt on for the suspect. And the Boston Celtics failed to complete an unprecedented comeback as Miami Heat beat them in Game 7 to book a spot in the finals of the NBA against the Denver Nuggets. The United States is racing to ensure it doesn't default on its debt with only six days remaining for the deadline. The bill will face its final hurdles in Congress. For once, both sides of the aisle seem to be in agreement, not on some newfound common ground, but with compromises. House Republicans and Democrats are racing against time to secure congressional support for the U.S. debt ceiling crisis agreement. After months of stalling and frantic negotiations from both sides, President Joe Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy finally sealed an in-principle deal on Sunday. At a Memorial Day service on Monday, President Biden proclaimed he was feeling good about the agreement reached. Look, you know I never say I'm confident what the Congress is going to do, but I feel very good about it. I spoke to a number of the members. I spoke to McConnell. I spoke to uh, a whole bunch of people, and it feels good. We'll see when the vote starts. And look, one of the things that I hear some of you guys saying is, why didn't Biden say what a good deal it is? Why would Biden be saying what a good deal is before the vote? You think that's going to help me get a pass? No. Not everybody shares this sentiment. Ultra-conservative Republicans have criticized McCarthy, alleging the Speaker failed to secure deeper federal cuts in his negotiations. Progressive Democrats, on the other hand, are equally unhappy that the president agreed to curb federal spending at all. What has irked Democrats the most is the surprised inclusion of provisions to accelerate the completion of an oil pipeline. The president has sent a message Uh, at dissenting Democrats urging them to talk to him. The agreement has been a mutual climb down for both sides of the aisle. Biden initially refused to entertain fiscal cuts, accusing Republicans of holding the American economy hostage. Republicans, meanwhile, failed to secure the larger cuts to the federal budget they were pushing for, instead agreeing to keep non-defense spending flat for the next one and a half years. If the deal fails to pass through in Congress on Wednesday, the U.S. government will no longer have access to funds it needs to pay off its debt. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Failure to meet the deadline could have cascading effects that could end in fully-fledged federal default. The repercussions would be disastrous for U.S. and the global economy as well. Well, for more on this, we are being joined by Kenneth Kuttner from Massachusetts. He is professor of economics at Williams College in Massachusetts. Professor, welcome to We On and thank you for joining us. President Biden says that he's feeling good about the agreement being reached. Do you think that it will be possible for both leaders to sell this deal to their allies in Congress where Republicans control the House and Democrats control the Senate? Well, that's a good question. That's uh, really 
uh, sort of an imponderable, as you uh, noted in the introduction, there are a lot of opposition on the Republican side. Uh, a lot of the Republicans uh, feel that it's not as sufficient, um, uh, not, the budget cuts are not sufficient. Um, a lot of the Democrats are happy or unhappy about the nature of the, um, the, the cuts being proposed. But I should say uh, at the outset that really the battle is not about budget cuts per se. It's not about the size of, of borrowing, size of the size of the deficit at all. It's really more about the prioritization of um, the policy. So for the, the actual money involved is really quite small. Uh, and as you noted in the introduction, it would simply keep spending flat for a year or two uh, and would not really entail any cuts at all. So, um, but really, this is a way for the Republicans to get certain policy changes that uh, they, they have felt very strongly about, such as denying the IRS some funds for, for, uh, for tax enforcement, uh, for imposing work requirements on our food stamps program, and uh, in decreasing the uh, regulation uh, associated with environmental permitting. So really, these are not uh, these do not have a very big budgetary impact at all. These are just ways for Republicans to push their uh, their favorite policy changes. Yet, how worried should we be if the debt ceiling isn't lifted by June 5th? After all, that's next Monday. But on the other hand, it seems no one in Washington wants to be responsible for a default. Uh, yeah, so how much should we worry? I, I wish there was some historical experience we could go by that would allow me to answer that question. But really, this is an example of something that is utterly unknowable. Uh, we've come close to having uh, come to come close to defaults before. At one point a number of years ago, we came so close that the, the credit rating in the United States was actually downgraded by a notch. Uh, so some corporations here in the United States actually have higher bond ratings than, than the federal government, which is, which is pretty weird. Uh, but the, um, you know, the, the really two, um, a number of ways in which this might proceed uh, if we uh, hit the, the, the deadline and passed it without a deal. Um, the, the problem, you know, there are certain kinds of expenditures that, the, that are not really essential uh, for the government to make. So, for instance, it might delay, you know, pension payments or payments to um, the pay of federal employees or something like that. And that would be uh, very inconvenient and uh, uh, for a lot of people involved and for some people it would be a huge hardship, but it wouldn't, uh, this kind of thing that wouldn't endanger the, the government's credit rating or anything like that. Um, the big problem would be if the government, if the Treasury were unable to pay back principal and or interest on its maturing uh, securities. Now you're talking about a major financial train wreck uh, for, because the, 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 the securities, Treasury securities are a, such a huge part of the financial market. Um, for two reasons. One is that so many other uh, securities are priced off of treasury. So companies that are uh, taking out a loan or, or lending money or banks that are lending money to others benchmark their rates off of U.S. Treasury rates, which are assumed to be risk free. So is, if, the, if the U.S. Treasury rates started to be associated with the risk premium, then all those other rates would be uh, would rise proportionately. And uh, the rates that people thought they were going to get would be uh, would be changed all of a sudden. But perhaps a more worrying concern is that uh, there's a, um, you know, so there are about $31 trillion worth of U.S. Treasuries uh, in circulation. Uh, and many of those are being are used as collateral for borrowing. So a, a financial institution might need some funds short term. And what we'll do if it has treasury securities, mm -hmm. we'll post those treasury yeah. securities as collateral in the repo market. And if those, uh, if the re if the collateral suddenly becomes defaultable or there's a risk of default on the collateral, then the whole house of cards uh, would uh, would collapse in that uh, three three trillion dollar market, and then you could expect some severe financial fallout, um, right. uh, illiquidity liquidity problems. So that that's my that mm -hmm. that's what keeps me up. At well, night. Professor Kenneth Kuttner. Well, thank you so much for that elaborate analysis, Professor Kenneth Kuttner, joining us live from Massachusetts this morning. I look forward to speaking to you again very soon, and hopefully, we won't see that default. <laughs> yes, I hope so, too. Well, amid speculations of possible thought in U.S.-China ties, China has now declined a U.S. invitation for a meeting between Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and his Chinese counterpart, Li Shang Fu, according to the Pentagon. He was invited for a meeting in Singapore this week on the sidelines of the Shangri-La Dialogue. According to officials, China declined the invitation overnight. Pentagon spokesman said, and this is a quote, China's concerning unwillingness to engage in meaningful military to military discussions will not diminish the Defense Department's commitment to seeking open lines of communication with the People's Liberation Army. 
Remember, Li was sanctioned by the U.S. government back in 2018 for buying Russian weapons. But the Pentagon says that the sanctions don't prevent Austin from conducting official business with him. The meeting this year could have been crucial amid multiple concerns, including tensions in the Taiwan Strait. Also, an alleged Chinese spy balloon that was shot down by the U.S. warplane after traveling across the country. The meeting would also have been in addition to the list of recent meetings between U.S. and Chinese officials. These include a meeting between U.S. National Security Advisor Jave Sullivan with top Chinese diplomat Wang Yi in Vienna earlier this month. Recently, U.S. President Joe Biden said that he believes relations between the two superpowers may begin to, quote, thaw very shortly, signaling that high-level talks could become more frequent. This gave observers a hope of a possible thaw between the two nations, but the latest move by China might not indicate the same. And right now, there is. India and the United States have a pact schedule ahead of a Prime Minister Modi's visit to the United States in June and U.S. President Joe Biden's visit in September. We all spoke to U.S. Ambassador to India, Eric Garcetti, on a broad range of issues, including whether India will join the NATO Plus alliance, talks of a broader train framework, and his trip to Mumbai to meet his favorite star, Shah Rukh Khan. This is a busy time for India-U.S. relationship. Much is happening, and of course, the Prime Minister is likely to visit the United States in June. Who better to talk to but Ambassador Garcetti, who is with us today. 20 months after he was first nominated. Ambassador, thank you very much for talking to Vion and welcome to India. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for thank having you. me. Ambassador, what is the broad outlook for the India-US relationship in the next four to five years? As I said, the Prime Minister is also slated to be in America in June. This is one of the strongest relationships in the world and one of the most important relationships, friendships in the world. It's natural, it's generational, it's deep. And I think that you'll see this year with the Prime Minister's visit and the President's visit here for G20, an even deepening of that relationship, not just between our leaders, but between our people. I think we have the ability to counterbalance the world and to do a lot of good together in the world. And for most Indians and Americans, we're just fond of each other. And this will be, I think, reflected in the substantive work that we do, as well as the spirit of the work we do, too. Well, there are also some talks about uh, the NATO Plus, India joining the NATO Plus. Does that also mean that India will be getting F-16s? Uh, can you throw some more light on this? You know, we have deepened our defense cooperation unimaginable 30 years ago, 40 years ago, leaning in further with India than sometimes we have with some of our closest allies, co-production, uh, being able to sell important systems to make sure that India is safe. So I think anything is on the table. It's really up to India to decide what makes best sense for India. But I know for one thing, whether it's the Quad or now the Indo-Pacific, we are linked together. The eastern edge is the United States. The western edge is here in India of a common region where we want freedom respected. We want to make sure that we are safe and that peace, prosperity, our planet and our people are all promoted. Right. Well, you talked about the Indo-Pacific. Now, when we talk about China, what are the areas of convergence and difference between the relationship that India has and the U.S. has with China? You know, first of all, our relationship is not defined by any third country, but where the strength of our friendship can talk about things, whether it's China policy or Indo-Pacific more broadly, I think we're aligned across the board. We want to have freedom of navigation in the seas. We want to have open trade. We want supply chains that are diverse and not dependent on any one place. So, you know, our strategy has been to de-risk. In moments of need, we've been there for the Indian defense infrastructure to help make sure that borders are respected, that sovereignty is maintained, and vice versa. We see Indians now more um, exercises, for instance, militarily, are done with the United States than any other country in the world for the Indian military. So this is deep. It's not about a third country. It's really about our friendship. But where we need to be aligned, we are aligned across the board. Right. When you talk about the IPF framework, uh, you know, recently it was decided to, you know, diversify the supply chains and reduce dependence on China. 
uh, what is India and the U.S. thinking in terms of trade? One official recently said that they are thinking big. Does that include FTA bringing back the GSP? I think it's everything. I think it's looking at supply chains, it's looking at labor, it's looking at the way we can train, uh, having a workforce that could come from India into the United States and vice versa, investments. I think if you see something like an iPhone, which is now being manufactured here in India, an American company that's brought a global supply chain here, it's a great example. When India gets it right and the United States gets it right, we can help each other but also help the world. And it's not just about de-risking, it's also about doing good. When we saw, for instance, during the pandemic, Indian pharmaceutical, where there were syringes that were going to Africa, the work that we did together on vaccines, we know that in crisis and in opportunity, if our economies are tied more closely together, we can do more. So I would say those discussions, which our, our um, Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo, who visited here, is launching, really is saying the sky's the limit. But instead of a trade agreement, let's have a trade framework so that we can put all of those things together. One final question. Uh, you met Shah Rukh Khan in Bombay. How was that experience? Uh, you spoke fondly about Shah Rukh Khan. It was so exciting. I mean, I come from Hollywood, yeah. and he's the king of Bollywood. He's investing in Los Angeles in a cricket team. Um, we hit it off immediately. Um, two guys who I think see the world in the same way, but also somebody who's been not just a symbol to India, but a symbol to the world. And I hope that we can bridge Hollywood and Bollywood, Hollywood and Tollywood, and ha see that these two great cultural icons, these two great cultural countries, can do so much together. So I can't wait to welcome him uh, in the United States soon. Ambassador Garcetti, thank you very much for talking to Vion and all the best for your tenure here and to many more conversations with you. I with look future. forward to them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Back to you in studio. Taking note of the crazy fandom enjoyed by Taylor Swift, the Museum of Arts and Design in New York City is celebrating her career by showcasing glimpses of Swift's era for much cheaper prices. Our next report brings you all the details. What can we say about Taylor Swift that hasn't been said already? Her relationship with her fans continues to remain a never-ending love story. Swift has seen the kind of fame that is unheard of. At 33, she enjoys the global limelight where nearly the entire world gets obsessed with her moves, music and dating life. But it all comes with a high cost for fans who wish to see her perform on stage live. Understanding this craze, the Museum of Arts and Design in New York has filled their second floor featuring dozens of costumes and objects spanning her music videos, tours and award show performances. Their goal is to showcase how Swift uses clothing and props to tell stories almost as much as she does lyrics. One of the things we want people to take away from this show is how somebody like Taylor Swift is using costumes and props like a vocabulary in order to build a story. This is all about storytelling and I think these objects are an essential part of those stories. She's always telling a story not just with her lyrics but with the way she looks and she does that like not only in her videos but also in her outfits on tour so it's really cool to see like those outfits up close. The real showstopper at the museum is the red gown. The flowing red wedding dress was worn by Swift in the music video, I Bet You Think About Me. Taylor Swift's Storyteller is on display through September 4. Tickets cost $25 and grant visitors full access to the rest of the museum. Bureau Report, we on World is One. Well, the Miami Heat have denied the Boston Celtics a record-breaking achievement in the NBA. Miami halted Boston's remarkable fight back with a crushing win in the series decider, which books their place in the NBA Finals against the Denver Nuggets. Eight seed Miami led the Eastern Conference Finals 3-0 before last season's runner-up won the straight to set up a series decider on their home court. The Celtics had the chance as well as the momentum to become the first team ever to win a series from a three-game deficit. But Miami 
were in no mood to be on the wrong side of history. The visitors were dominant and raced to an 11-point lead by halftime. The pattern continued in the second half, and Boston couldn't get close. Miami tailsman Jimmy Butler finished with 28 points, while Caleb Martin netted 26 points and had 10 rebounds. Boston shot a poor 39%. From the field, a no Celtic player managed to score 20 points in the game. The sold-out Boston Garden even booed the home players as Miami essentially ended the contest in the third quarter itself. Miami completed a 103-84 to point triumph to return to the finals for the first time since 2020. The Heat also became only the second eighth seed to reach the championship series after the New York Knicks in 1999, Western Conference top seed Denver Nuggets await in the NBA Finals with Game 1 taking place on Thursday. ...underappreciated team in the NBA this year, leading the West the entire year, and still nobody appreciates... I'm just confident. I know the work that we all put into it, so I know what we're capable of. But nobody's satisfied. We haven't done anything. Um, we don't play just to win the Eastern Conference. We play to win the whole thing. That's all the time we have for We On Live broadcast, New York City. I'm Susan Tamrani. Thank you so much for staying with us and watching, but don't go away. A lot more news and headlines are coming up next, only on We On World Is One.